<laughs> well, my name is uh, Mel Weitzman. Uh, my Dharma name is Sojin. Um, how could you Sojin? Uh, when I was ordained, when I was ordained, Suzuki Roshi um, gave me the name uh, Sojin, and then um, when I was given Dharma transmission by his son in Japan, Aitsu. Uh, he gave me the name Haku Ryu. So I don't, I don't, I don't want to go into uh, explaining what that means. But, <laughs> um, uh, you know, uh, Zen Mind Beginner's Mind was the first book that, um, <clears throat> uh, of Suzuki Roshi's talks. Yes. Uh, Suzuki Roshi had um, come to America in 1959. And um, he was invited by the Sokoji Temple, which was um, an old synagogue, maybe one of the first synagogues in San Francisco, uh, that was um, abandoned. And uh, the, when the Japanese, my understanding is, when the Japanese got out of the concentration camp in, in, uh, um, after the, the war, Second World War, they bought that building. They pooled their money and bought that building uh, at um, 1881 Bush Street, San Francisco. <clears throat> so um, they, the, the Japanese had held, um, uh, um, it was like a church. Like a, it, was, it was Soto Zen, but uh, it was, um, there was no Zazen no meditation. And they had a go club and they had, um, uh, I think it was Sunday um, uh, services. They were trying, I think their effort was to blend into the American style of uh, worship. And so they were like a Protestant congregation in a way, uh, even though it was Buddhist. And they had sermons and and uh, clubs and uh, the way uh, many American um, uh, religious organizations do. And um, when Suzuki Roshi came, uh, he was a kind of anomaly in a way. Um, he, he said um, Zazen every morning, and people heard about him. Some, you know, it was not too long after the Second World War. And uh, a lot of uh, servicemen and women had been uh, in Japan and uh, had um, looked up Japanese uh, Zen and uh, been to some of the temples and so forth. And so they were very curious and, and wondered if there was someone in America who could teach that. Uh, Zazen, just for those who don't know, is sitting in meditation. Za means to sit. And uh, uh, Zen is um, uh, whatever Zen is. <laughs> uh, so, um, uh, he used to sit in, you know, the, the temple, Sokoji Temple, um, was, had a upstairs, and the downstairs was like an auditorium, and it had the pews, and it had a stage. <clears throat> and, um, Suzuki Roshi sat in the pews. <laughs> <clears throat> so, he, when people would call him up, and, uh, ask if they could do something with him. And so he uh, uh, said, okay. He said, I said it, it was 545 at that time. I sit at 545 every morning. And if you like, you can come and join me. So they did. And little by little, uh, the, 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 a small congregation uh, appeared. And uh, uh, eventually, after a couple of years, uh, 
the Japanese congregation gave him this upstairs room, a nice, beautiful square room with uh, windows that were on the floor, kind of an attic-like place. Um, <clears throat> it was beautiful, the light was beautiful. Anyway, <laughs> um, so that's where <clears throat> um, the practice emerged. <clears throat> My voice is a little rough this morning. <clears throat> um, so little by little, uh, uh, the practice developed. I came in 1964 um, when Zen Center was just beginning to mushroom a little bit. And Katagiri uh, Sensei, uh, Sensei means teacher, <clears throat> Katagiri Sensei um, arrived a year before me, and he was uh, a Japanese priest who was curious about Suzuki Roshi. And uh, he arrived in LA, Los Angeles, and he came to Sokoji to see if he could help Suzuki Roshi. And um, so the two of them uh, were like our examples of, of practice. Uh, Suzuki Roshi would come in through, through the door every morning, 545, his office door, or two doors, his office door, and um, uh, offer incense and sit zazen, Katagiri would do the, um, uh, the service. He would play the, play the instruments, the uh, wooden fish drum, and the, um, uh, the round key, which is the bell, and um, they would chant, and we would chant along with them in Japanese. So for quite a while, we, we all, we just did everything in, in Japanese. And we, <clears throat> it was so unusual, you know, it's just, it was such an unusual practice because we um, come into the Zendo through the main door, and I mean, the, the, the students, and uh, it was a bare room with uh, goza mats around the perimeter. Goza mats are these thin mats, uh, Japanese mats, which you fold up, you take to the beach sometimes. <laughs> and um, uh, so his students would sit on the goza mat on, on, on these black cushions. And you can, It looks bigger than it is because <laughs> it's in front of me. <laughs> um, called a zafu. A za means to sit. And so it's, it's the foo that we sit on. <laughs> uh, and we cross our legs any way we could and uh, sit for 40 minutes. And you know, when, when people begin to sit, we didn't have a lot of experience. His students did not have a lot of experience sitting. And so when you begin to sit, you know, it's like uh, any kind of physical activity. Um, you have to work yourself, work your body into, into feeling comfortable. But before that, you don't feel so comfortable because your knees hurt <laughs> and so forth. And so it's a kind of challenge to do that when you're beginning to sit. Um, and so we have our, uh, the students would all have their little uh, drama, drama, private dramas, individual dramas together. And um, I remember how difficult it was for me to sit zazen. Uh, you, you know, it's the most confined posture that you can, I mean, you can have other kinds of confined postures, like putting your uh, legs behind your ears or something like that. <laughs> but this is simply sitting, sitting with, um, it, you know, you can put one, one leg up or two legs up. There's, there's the lotus position, you know, 
various <laughs> um, uh, variations of the lotus position. The lotus position is where both legs are up on your thighs. And the half lotus position is where one leg is up on your thigh. Then there's the quarter lotus position and, and you know, variations. I always uh, encourage people to do what is easiest for them because sitting, you may be able to put your legs in a lotus position, but uh, to hold, to keep that comfortably for 40 minutes or an hour, uh, uh, you have to work yourself into that. So we never insist that people do that, but it's a kind of, you know, in the back of your mind, you want to do that. <laughs> so um, uh, nowadays, it's much easier for people to blend into the sitting because the students are, are so much um, more mature than we were in those days. And so you have that uh, um, precedent uh, or, or encouragement from the older students. The older students encourage the, the newer students and the newer students encourage the older students because the, the, uh, the, the newer students don't know what they're getting into. <laughs> <laughs> and so you see their naivety and their, and their, um, and their uh, courage in order to, to do this. So it's, uh, and, their their naive practice encourages our uh, older people's um, uh, uh, mature mature, mature students uh, practice. So Suzuki Roshi was um, you know he would sit with us every day. What impressed me about Suzuki Roshi, um, you know, I had been an artist. A painter. I studied with uh, Clifford Still at the Art Institute in San Francisco. And I was, you know, I was in my early 20s. And, um, you know, I had a lot of learning to do about life. <laughs> I was, um, when I, I was 35, though, when I went to, came to, to Zen Center to practice. And um, uh, I, I was looking for something. I was looking for a, a good, you know, a, 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 a spiritual practice. And when I sat down in the in the in the Sokoji Temple on the Zafu, <laughs> um, that that first time it, it felt wonderful to me. And so. Uh, at some point, not too too long after that, as I would uh, go to Zen Center to sit to Sokoji, um, uh, I realized that this is what I was looking for, and I've just been doing it ever since. Suzuki Roshi was always encouraging. You know, um, I would say that the um, uh, one of the characteristics, one of the main characteristics of his teaching. Uh, was uh, to encourage people. And he just uh, had a way of doing that. He had a way of looking at people or addressing people or interacting with them that he could see all the way to the bottom of their, uh, uh, of who they were. And so people were very attracted to him because of that. The kind of charisma, I guess you'd call it. But not charisma in a, in a superficial sense, but in a, a very sincere, um, unselfconscious way. He wasn't trying to do anything. Um, you know, people say Suzuki Roshi developed a Zen center and, and uh, uh, wrote Zen Mind Beginner's Mind. He didn't write Zen Mind Beginner's Mind. <laughs> uh, Zen Mind, you know, when he first came to, to Sokoji, um, uh, he gave talks. But aside from teaching a sazen, he gave talks. And um, 
the talks that he gave went into becoming Zen by beginner's mind. Uh, Trudy Dixon, Trudy Dixon um, was the main editor of Zen Mind Beginner's Mind. She was a wonderful student of his. She died of cancer uh, not too, late, too long after that. And she was pretty young. Um, but she devoted herself during her, the, the time of her illness to um, editing Zen Mind Be Beginner's Mind. And it was just a collection of his talks. He didn't mean to, 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 to have it in a book. He was just teaching us, right? So these are his teachings that he was teaching us. Um, and um, he, he, uh, um, he taught in various ways, mostly Although he gave these talks and he sat zazen with us and, and so forth, um, we learned from the way he walked and the way he sat down and the way he put on his, his, uh, his sandals and the way he ate, <laughs> which was just so simple. It was simple, just like anybody, any ordinary person. His movements were just like almost any other, except there was a certain um, uh, uh, settledness in his actions that was so impressive. Everybody would, but you couldn't tell it. You couldn't tell it from, people say, well, they, people who hadn't met Suzuki Roshi, often think well, he was a stern Zen master, you know, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but he was just this quiet little guy, ordinary person. His ordinariness, it's his ordinariness which was so extraordinary. <laughs> he, and people, well, he started Zen Center. Actually, he didn't. He, well, you could say, yes, he did, but actually, he encouraged the people around him to do what they wanted to do. He encouraged the students to do what they wanted, but he was always guiding them in a way. Uh, he was his teaching without teaching, teaching beyond teaching. Um, uh, but everybody was impressed with him. I don't know anybody that wasn't impressed with him inside Zen Center or outside. Uh, and it was his ordinariness that was so extraordinary. And um, so his um, students organized Zen Center, his students incorporated Zen Center, his students um, uh, um, supported Zen Center, and Suzuki Yoshi was just being himself. And he didn't say, you should do this or you should do that. He, what he, he, he loved his students. I would say he loved his students, but um, uh, because, for, for various reasons, as Americans, they didn't know anything. We, knew, we didn't know anything. <laughs> we didn't know anything about Buddhism. We didn't know anything about Zen. We didn't know anything about meditation. And that was, for him, that was, he, he felt this was the material that he could really mold. Uh, and without any pre we had no preconceptions and we had no ideas about it that were meant anything. <laughs> so he could just, you know, and he was so skilled, so skillful at doing this. He didn't hardly knew he was doing it. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of, his early students had a lot of pain when we were sitting zazen. But he encouraged us to get beyond our attachments. That, uh, uh, 
one of his uh, main teachings was to um, make us aware of our attachments and what it is that uh, holds us back, what it is that um, uh, captivates us. You know, um, uh, um, one of his, his uh, um, things that he emphasized, he says, don't get caught by anything. And we don't realize how, you know, um, how we are all addicted to something. <laughs> we are all addicted to something. We're addicted to money. We're addicted to clothes. We're addicted to cars. We're addicted to, you know, uh, you know, it, um, uh, the second noble truth, Buddha's second noble truth is um, we suffer because of our, in, our uh, um, uh, too much desire. Uh, there's nothing wrong with desire. Desire is necessary. But we get caught by um, uh, desires that are harmful. We don't know how to adjust ourselves. We don't know how to adjust our desires um, to be beneficial rather than to be uh, to, to harm us. So that was for him non attachment. And of course, he's just teaching us basic Buddhism. Basic Buddhism is uh, uh, to be how to be free from attachment, which doesn't mean not to have attachments but to be free within attachments. <laughs> so, um, uh, at some point, well, well, um, uh, I, I just want to go back a little bit to Zazen and, and the kind of discomfort that we have in Zazen when, we, when we're actually not just beginners, but you know, discomfort, or what we call discomfort, um, uh, is um, uh, pretty endemic to Zazen. And so how, how what we learn is how to be uh, free within our problems how to be free within our discomfort uh, and to go through the other side. You know, my <clears throat> definition of suffering is uh, there's pain and there's suffering. Pain is just a, a sensation. Suffering is when you don't like it. <laughs> so how do you deal with uh, our painful life um, without uh, succumbing to suffering, although suffering is really important for us. Um, so I'm, uh, um, when I first started sitting <coughs> with Suzuki Roshi, um, you know, we had 40 minute periods of sitting and, and uh, five minutes before the end, Everybody's getting kind of antsy, you know. When is it? When is it going to be over? <laughs> when is he going to ring the bell? And then, as soon as just just before that, he said, "We will sit for ten minutes more." <laughs> <laughs> and everybody go, "Oh my God!" But this, he taught us how to deal with suffering. He taught us how to deal with pain and suffering. Uh, which to me was the most valuable part of his teaching. Because uh, how to be free from pain and suffering is through non-attachment. And, um, you know, we rely so much on our um, desires that we think that if we don't have them, life will be meaningless. <laughs> but it's not true. 
what I was impressed by him, uh, and then I never wanted to repeat anything before I started practicing. You know, I just wanted to be a free spirit. When I started to practice, I observed him. He would come out of his office every morning, as I said, and bow, uh, offer incense, take his seat. And when he would, um, when Zazen was over, we'd have a service and they, uh, chanting the Heart Sutra three times in Japanese, bowing. And then we would pass through his office and he would bow to each one of us as we left. And um, then he would, he would repeat that every afternoon. So every morning and every afternoon, he did that. And he seemed content to do that. It, it was more than content. It was like fulfillment. He, I always felt that he felt fulfilled by that simple um, mantra of activity, his, his activity of um, coming out of his office in the morning, doing the, doing the zazen and the service, and coming back, bowing to his students, and uh, day after day. And it was like he, he had found his um, rhythm there was a certain rhythm that he had that um, he was always right in time. You never felt that he was flustered or out of time. That his, um, I think his rhythm was, uh, he was totally settled in himself. And um, never in a hurry. He was, he was never too slow. He was never too fast. He was always it, it settled in himself. And that's what he was teaching us, how to be settled in ourself. <clears throat> um, so then, uh, we would also have long sittings, you know, sashins, uh, which is uh, common to Zen practice. Seven days, set, sitting for seven days, um, eating our meals, uh, which are prepared by our cooks. And um, uh, a certain kind of formality. So, you know, people look at our Soto Zen practice and they say, oh, that's very formal. You know, you do everything in a formal way. But when you become accustomed to it, it, it it's all informal. So although Suzuki Roshi had this formal practice, everything he did was felt informal. It was, it's a kind of casual and informal, even though it was formal. <laughs> but it was within, uh, it, that that wonderful settled um, uh, um, rhythm that he had, and <clears throat> you know, formality is simply a way of doing things together, so you so you don't bump into each other. <laughs> it, when you look, when you. Uh, analyze the formality. It's it's just a way of doing things that makes it easier to do things. You don't have to explain something to people every time, or figure out or try to figure out. Well, what am I going to do now? It's all there. You just simply go through the forms, and and it's like a, a choreographed. You know, Soto Zen is a very the formality of Soto Zen is in, in Japan is choreographed. Every morning they have this service in the monastery, uh, and it's all choreography. The young acolytes, the young monks, um, and the, and the older monks, you know, have this interaction, which is uh, all choreographed, and um, it's like ballet in a sense, especially at um, Sojiji. 
yeah, monastery. But we're, we don't have that. That's, that's you know, J Japanese. I, I don't want to talk about the Japanese and Americans. It's too big a subject. But um, uh, we, Suzuki Roshi did not try to make us into Japanese. Whereas if you go to Japan and practice as an American, they expect you, you know, to become Japanese. And then when you're about ready to do that, they think, oh my God, they're not Japanese. <laughs> and everything falls apart. <laughs> so, um, uh, the, 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 um, the, the Japanese administration, the, the uh, Soto Zen administration, um, would come sometimes to Sokoji and uh, they'd ball Suzuki Roshi out. They'd say, What are you doing here? What are you doing? You know, uh, um, and so he. He did not have much of a relationship, a good relationship with the, um, the Soto Shield in Japan. And so we always felt that we were kind of independent from Japan. From Japan. And uh, Suzuki Roshi didn't try it. He once tried to register his, his priests, the priests that he ordained with Japan, but that uh, somehow, I think that they did, but they, we didn't keep up a relationship, so that kind of fell by the way. So it's only later, after he died, and uh, uh, when I was or after I was ordained, Suzuki Roshi ordained me actually in 1967, 69. Suzuki Roshi ordained me in 1969. He said, uh, um, I, you know, we had a, a um, I'm kind of diverting, you know, getting a little off my track, but um, things occurred to my head. So <clears throat> uh, we, we had done the, what we called the first Sashin at Tassahara. Sashin is the long, a week-long um, uh, Zazen retreat. And I, it was really hot there in the middle of the summer, <laughs> over 100. And I couldn't sit very, I could, you know, I'd only been practicing for about three years. And um, it was really hard. But he called me in, a afterward, he called me in to his um, cabin and said, I would like uh, to ordain you. So that's how I became ordained in 69. He said, I'd like you to join our order. And I, I said, well, do you think I'm, when, when, when do you want to do that? And he said, oh, when you're ready, and when I'm ready. So it took a couple of years and, um, for him to ordain me. So I, I, I want to talk more about him than me. So. Um, uh, we, we had very little contact with, with the Japanese uh, Soto Shu in Japan. Um, whereas most uh, Japanese Zen teachers uh, who came to America did have some connection with the Japanese uh, Soto Shu, Shu in school. Um, So we, uh, our American practice developed as uh, independently of the Japanese school in Japan. And when Suzuki, after Suzuki Roshi died, um, there was a question of who should be, well, he, he named Richard Baker as his successor. Um, but um, uh, how we should, you know, should we court the Japanese Sotoshu? 
uh, and we decided that we wouldn't and that we would go our own way, given what Suzuki Roshi had offered us. I mean, we grew up with him and um, find our way as, as Americans uh, and developing Americans. And so that's what we did, have done. And there have been various problems and so forth. Um, <laughs> um, now this is Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. This old copy. And there's Suzuki Roshi. <laughs> this uh, picture was taken by a guy named, a man, a photographer named Bob Booney. And he was a very good photographer. And uh, he liked Zen Center and he liked Suzuki Roshi. And so he took the famous pictures of, or the well known pictures of Suzuki Roshi. And um, this is um, a calligraphy of Suzuki Roshi's that um, was done with a piece of, at Tassahara, with a piece of manzanita, a kind of manzanita. Um, yucca. Yucca. Yeah, yucca. They have these yucca trees, that, plants that grow on the hillside. So a branch from the yucca. yucca. Uh, Quiet. Um, so at some point, uh, 1969, six, um, uh, Richard Baker, his, his main successor, found uh, this place called Tassahara because people, his, his, his um, students wanted um, to find they thought, well, let's, what, let's get a monastery, let's create a monastery. Um, you know, they were, every, the students were all getting enthusiastic about um, the practice and wondered if it would be a good idea to have a monastery. And Suzuki Yoshi said, oh, okay, <laughs> in his usual manner. And um, uh, so, uh, Richard found this place called Tassahara in the Ventana wilderness um, uh, across the, the mountains from Big Sur. And uh, it was called Tassahara, the place where they dried meat. <laughs> uh, and uh, we actually fundraised and bought the place. And so we had a primitive monastery. It was um, a, a, a 24 cabins or something like that. It was, it was actually a resort. It was a, a 14 miles over the mountains into this um, singular resort because it had a wonderful uh, hot, tub, hot bath, um, uh, steam baths natural steam baths and sulfur baths and people would go there um you know it, it, before the uh, up until i think the the 20s um it, it was people got in there by st stagecoach and horseback and walking <laughs> uh, 14 miles into the ventana into the ventana wilderness and um, uh, it had a hotel which had burned down and it had a bar and it had, you know, the facilities like that. And uh, so the Zendo, uh, the bar uh, became the Zendo. <laughs> and it was a stone building. And then it has other, other buildings as well, um, and a, kitchen, a small kitchen and so forth. And so we just set up camp there and uh, little by little developed what is now Tassahara Zen Monastery. Um, so 
So Tassahara became a big focus um, for Zen students. And um, I think uh, Zen became kind of popularized through Tassahara um, because of the, the first Zen monastery in America, Buddhist monastery. And we were just out, you know, we were like pioneers out there in the wilderness creating this um, uh, monastery. Um, and then Suzuki Roshi um, invited a couple of other Zen priests. Um, uh, one was um, uh, Koban, uh, Chino. Chino. Uh, <clears throat> Chino Sensei, Koban Chino Sensei, um, who uh, was a young uh, priest who had um, uh, uh, been at uh, a Heiji monastery in Japan. And uh, I had met these two students of, Zen, of, of Suzuki Roshi who were practicing there at the time. And so he was invited over by uh, somebody else, actually, and Suzuki Roshi kidnapped him and brought him to Tassahara. <laughs> and uh, he was one of our wonderful teachers as well. And then there was a, a teacher called <clears throat> um, uh, Yoshimura Sensei, uh, who came for a year or two. Uh, and you were, all of our Japanese teachers were wonderful to us. They, we, all they wanted to do was help us. And they saw our, our um, we were like children, you know, um, to them uh, who uh, were going to school and they wanted to, you know, help Suzuki Roshi. And they did. And um, during that time, uh, just um, 19, 19, in the 60, 1967, Suzuki Roshi used to come to um, Berkeley, and he came to Los Altos. There was a uh, Les K had a developed a and Miriam Mer, Mer, Derby uh, developed a um, small zendo in um, uh, Los Altos. And Suzuki Yoshi would go there on certain days in the morning. Zazen, and you come to Berkeley, uh, he asked me to um, find a place in Berkeley where we could have him uh, because we, we were having getting more and more stu students in Berkeley. And then Bill Kwan, who was one of his earliest students, wonderful priest, um, uh, went to um, Sonoma. and developed a uh, place called Genjoji. He called it Genjoji. So um, those were three um, satellites that were developed at that time. And uh, uh, Suzuki Yoshi would come to those three places alternately on a certain mornings. But when we got Tassahara, when we started developing Tassahara, he just he he couldn't do that anymore because he was so um, busy with the other places. Um, so uh, the other teachers would come, Kadigiri would come, Shino Sensei would come, and so forth. So uh, and Yoshimura. Um, during this time, Suzuki Roshi was um, developing cancer. And 
um, his cancer was developed, liver cancer, mostly certain aspects of uh, certain kind of liver cancer. So he was becoming more and more um, uh, bound to his ha to his place, and he, and so his other his other teachers were doing a lot of the traveling. Um, he finally uh, died in December 19. I'll tell you how he did that. 1971. Uh, um, but uh, so this Bill Kwong and I were more and more on our own. And um, uh, Richard Baker was eventually took over San Francisco as the abbot. And the rest of us were left uh, kind of in uh, limbo because um, our teacher was gone. And uh, Dick was not a big help to us, Richard Baker. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you how Suzuki Roshi died. Um, we were having, every year we have what's called the Rohatsu Sashin, seven day Sashin, we call it, uh, of retreat. But we do just do zazen for seven days, from morning till night, with uh, walking meditation in between the period. And um, Suzuki Roshi, we knew it was really sick, and we didn't know when he was going to die, but we knew it would be soon. So in the morning, uh, at, during the first period of Zazen, we were sitting during this Rohatsu Sashin, which commemorates um, uh, Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment. So, Suzuki Roshi, well, so then we we said another period of zazen without getting up in between. So it, it was very ominous. We could feel that something was going on or not going on. And so um, uh, it's unusual to just do that. So someone came and got me and I went, we went upstairs and uh, where Suzuki Roshi was, his apartment. And uh, walking into the room, he was laying in the bed. And he, he, had, um, he was gone. And he had a blanket over him and his just um, rock so on his chest. And um, what uh, it, it created, you know, it, it, there was um, this deep feeling without, within the building. It was like uh, um, he had died, and right at the beginning of our session, right at the first, the first period, and there was nothing we could do but continue to sit for seven days. We couldn't. <laughs> couldn't do anything but sit for seven days. So uh, the feeling that I had, and I think most people had, was this is how he planned his demise, to plant himself in the, in the, in the middle of our practice and not give us an opportunity to do anything, <laughs> but continue to sit for seven days. And that was, a, our mourning period. But it was, you know, uh, uh, hard to describe, but his, his presence filled the whole building. That was, it was like tangible that uh, his presence just filled the whole building. <clears throat> uh, and so, it was, what do you do in that case? 
do you cry or do you laugh or do you... <laughs> it, it, it was sad and joyful at the same time um, a lot of mixed feelings um, and um, you know he was the root of the practice and his successors were the branches um, uh, coming up from the root. And uh, I always felt that his disciples, um, each one had some, char some characteristic that was part of his life that they expressed. And I always felt that together uh, we would create a wonderful practice. <laughs> um, blending those characteristics so that he, his presence would always be uh, at the root of our practice. So uh, to a certain extent, I think that's happened, but not as much as it could have. I wonder if, if you might talk about both how you and your Sangha mates uh, reacted to or were aware of the process of making the book. Oh, okay. Well, you know, um, there were not so many members at the time that the book was uh, produced. And uh, I think Richard Baker may have worked on it a little. Um, but um, uh, it was just it was just a few people working on the book. Uh, and I'm not sure that there were enough people who were aware that that was happening at the time. I think we knew that, that was happening. But um, I, I don't remember that much about about that, to tell you the truth. I remember that there was uh, there were there, uh, Trudy was working on the book as the main editor. Um, and we just kind of left it alone. I mean, you know, her husband, Mike, um, was more was my friend. And um, I don't know. It was just something that was going on. Well, the book, of course, is gigantically famous today. How yeah. quickly did you have a sense, did you and, and the whole community have a sense that this thing was taking off and was becoming a calling card? Didn't take long. <laughs> Pretty quickly, but very quickly. I mean, it was a unique, um, uh, a unique thing, a unique volume. And um, I think, you know, it woke people up. Um, it woke people up to the um, the fact that this something was happening here, and so many people were impressed by it, uh, and so many people didn't understand it, but were still impressed by it. <laughs> I don't know how many people actually understand it. Uh, to me, it's it's all very simple. Every time you read this, the characteristic of this book is that every time you read it, it's a different book. And I can read the book, you know, a hundred times, and every single time, it's a different book. So that it, maybe my memory is not very good. Well, it's not that good. But, <laughs> but even so, you know, uh, because as you, as you practice, your mind opens more to what's actually going on. You can read the, you know, read one of the chapters of the book and think you understand it, but, or not. And then you read it again a year later and it's different. It's like you thought that you un understood what was, what he was saying or, um, it, um, uh, you 
you know, um, they say that uh, Shakyamuni, when he was giving his talks, his sermons or whatever you call it, um, everybody understood what he was saying according to their own understanding, you know. And um, so he was talking to each person individually at the same time that he was talking to them collectively. <laughs> Suzuki Roshi's was like that. Um, uh, and sometimes when you read, you know, you don't always comprehend everything you read, but you, you, you go through it and you think you got it, you know. But then you read it again and you just certain passages stop you that you that you just passed over before. So that's one of, you know, um, one wonderful characteristics of, of his talks. Um, another, uh, there are several other books. One was um, uh, Branching Streams Flow Out of the Dark, which was his um, c commentary on uh, Sekito Kisen's uh, Sandokai. And Michael Wenger and I edited that book, or uh, those talks, and, and put it and made it into a book. <clears throat> it was really hard to edit those talks because he, he was talking in, in, in um, uh, branching streams. He's talking about a text or through a text, and which has its own chapters, and so it's. To, to bring all the scattered parts together to make sense, literally, in a literary sense, uh, was really difficult, but it's a good book. And then there's uh, um, Not Always So, which was edited by Ed Brown, and uh, he and I went over it many times um, to refine it. Uh, and so we're putting out a new book uh, one of my students, um, who was at Green Gulch, Jiryu, um, and I have been putting together a new Suzuki Roshi book. And um, it's almost, I mean, it's pretty far along. Yeah. Is there a main thrust to this new book? Well, you know, he talks about precepts, the meaning of precepts, which uh, uh, there are, are uh, you know, we took, we chose um, talks that we thought we liked. And then later, they haven't been completely categorized yet. But uh, aside from uh, the um, uh, precepts talks, which are pretty unique. <laughs> um, when he came to America, he went through the um, Lucliffe record, which is uh, 100 koans, 100 Zen, Zen stories, um, uh, which are not exactly stories, but are koans, which um, uh, illustrate uh, certain aspects of our understanding. And so we've uh, uh, incorporated a number of those, which have not, people don't, aren't, aren't so much aware of this, um, uh, talks on precepts. They mostly, it's, it's commentaries on, on uh, cases. And uh, they're all, you know, Little gems. <laughs> Suzuki Roshi asked me around 1967 to find a place in Berkeley because he'd been coming there and I was living there. I used to go there. I, I used to go to Sokochi in the morning, drive from Berkeley to, to um, uh, San Francisco uh, and pick up people on the way. <laughs> um, th uh, so we and then on Monday mornings, Suzuki Roshi would come to Berkeley and we'd do a uh, sit zazen 
And, and he would give a talk and then we'd have an informal breakfast. So people really enjoyed that a lot because it was very intimate time with him. And um, so um, since I was in Berkeley, um, he asked me to find a place, to a permanent place, because the uh, before that, the, pra- the, the Monday morning practice would go from being different people's houses. So he wanted a place that, that was stable. And uh, so I found this place, big place, <laughs> amazingly, um, uh, had a, a, three stories, the bottom story, the middle story, and the attic. And uh, so uh, we built up a, 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 a sangha there um, in that big, big house. Um, and uh, decided that we wanted to turn the attic place into the zendo. And so we did. Uh, um, we, um, the, um, the, the, the Sangha was very loyal to each other and to me. And <laughs> uh, over 12 years, we had developed this place. And we wanted to, we wanted to, always wanted to buy it, but the, the, um, the owner would never sell it to us, even though he kind of, you know, dragged us along. And so I, I we figured, um, uh, let's buy a place. Let's see if we can find a place to buy. It was different then than it is now. We thought that twenty-four thousand dollars was average for big place. Twenty-four thousand um, dollars. So um, somebody turned us on to this place that we ha- are now on Russell Street, which is four buildings, four houses. Uh, two two lots and uh, great good fortune and so uh, over time we developed this place the Berkeley Zendo Zen Center uh, these four buildings we lifted up one of one of our places and put a, a floor underneath it and and we took a house with um, two units and made it into a Zendo and. Uh, we have a great, a great um, uh, practice here. That's been we've been we've been here for fifty years all together in Berkeley for over fifty years. <laughs>